Hello everybody and welcome back. Hey, I want to thank you guys for liking and subscribing. Especially you subscribers. Hey, you, you guys are turning into part of our family. We call you affectionately note takers. Cliff note takers. Welcome aboard. All right. So electrolytes, how and where they work in the body. Part one, we want to come at you a couple of times with this and make sure everybody fully understands how the electrolytes work, okay? All right, and I'm Cliff Davis, the Associate Dean of Nursing and also Advanced Medical Surgical Professor. And at Cliff Notes, what are we doing? Helping students to see through larger concepts, right? What are we doing? Helping you to see through by giving you study smart strategies, all right? Now, this is something I made up called Electrolyte Man. It looks a little different. Yes, it does. But here's what's going on. I, as I'm looking at the fish bones and things and I see the different electrolytes and hopefully you guys have taken a look at that in the previous videos. If you go and check the uh, playlist under Diagnostic Lab Studies, check that out if you haven't yet. And this was one that I created and I'm adding to that list so to speak, right? To promote your understanding of electrolytes. Anyway, we're going to come back to this, okay? Alright, next up. You got it. Okay, here it is. So we're numbering our paper. Are you numbering your device from one to six? The six things that we're about to learn about, okay, when it comes to electrolytes. And, all right, so you're to briefly explain what these electrolytes are, what they do, right? So the first one, number one, Na, sodium, right? So, of course, these all take their abbreviations from the periodic table of elements. And sodium is Na. By the way, just in case, there are some people who might not understand this. When we say Na, sodium, right? The sodium could be too high in the blood. And we would say what? Hyper. Hyper is too high. Then what? Na, because we're referring to sodium. And then emia. So hypernatremia. Emia would be blood in the blood. So hyper, too high. Nay, sodium level, emia in the blood. Let's try that the other way. Hypo, right? Too low a level, nay, tremia. Too low a level of sodium in the blood. Hyponatremia. You with us? Good. So now, number two, potassium. Alright, what does that do? Chloride. What does it do in the body? Now we're gonna we're gonna break that chloride down into two actions. Okay? And then magnesium is number four, number five, calcium, and number six, phosphorus. Wow, there's a lot of information. That, oh, man, there's not enough room in these YouTube videos to put this stuff in, okay? So anyway, uh, here is the electrolytes superimposed onto electrolyte man. And what we're expecting you to understand by the time we're at the end of this. I know it looks complicated, but bear with me, okay? Yeah. All right. So, N, right? The Cliff Notes way. Na, sodium, reminds us of what? N, neurological issues. Right. So, if your patient's sodium level is too high or too low, we start to see neurological things happen to our client, changing their level of consciousness. Maybe they start to have seizures for the very first time in their life. These kinds of things. All right. So we take that Na and we apply it to a brain, right? And we want to remember that electrolyte man that I showed you previously has a crown of sodium. That reminds us of all those neurological changes that can take place. By the way, special note, hyponatremia is especially dangerous because you want to think of the signs and symptoms when it comes to that as CRS. Oh, wait a minute. We got to keep this clean because it's YouTube. <laughs> CRS. There might not be people out there who remember or have any idea what CRS stands for. Let's help you out. So CRS stands for can't remember shish kebabs. <laughs> That's right. Okay. So, right. Can't remember. Right. Where? In the brain. And what is it? CRS. Your patient can go into what? Coma? 
respiratory distress and seizures. Right, coma, respiratory distress and seizures. Especially pay attention to that respiratory distress. Hey, right? Uh, it could be a deadly situation for our patients. So now, let's move that to electrolyte man, right? What do we say? He has a crown of sodium. Next up, we want to look at K, potassium, right? And this time we'd be talking about hyperkalemia or hypokalemia. And when we're talking about that, we're talking about the heart. So we replace the C with the letter K and think of that as cardiac, right? And we know that two specific things happen especially that we see changes in our EKG traces, that when the potassium's too high, right, hyperkalemia, we see what? Tall, tinted T waves on our EKG traces. And if the potassium's too low, we see inverted T waves, which we also refer to as U waves. So, good. All right, lots of knowledge in that. Now we're gonna take this letter K and apply it to a heart. There we go. Kind of difficult to make out, but there's that K, right? K, potassium, cardiac, electrical impulses. All right, next up, after we put the heart there. So next, we want to talk about chloride. And one of the actions of chloride is that it clears the stomach. So we're all familiar with the fact that the stomach houses hydrochloric acid. And that helps to what? Clear the stomach of foodstuffs and break that stuff down. You know what? Let's add a little tidbit to just illuminate your knowledge here, okay? So if we took, if we took chloride, hydrogen chloride, right? Hydrochloric acid, and we poured it on this podium, commercial strength, it would start to make that podium start to smoke, right? And then the next question is, well, wait a minute. If we pour it on here, and it makes that wood smoke, right? Then what's it doing inside my stomach? Ah, here's what it's doing inside your stomach. And pardon this, hopefully you're not eating because it's going to sound gross, but bear with me. <laughs> we learned it, right? So here we go. So the reason why your hydrochloric acid isn't burning a hole into you, right? Is because your stomach is lined with mucus. Right? You have mucoid cells inside there in your, in your mucosa. That's what mucosa does, makes mucus. Right? And that mucus is a repellent to acid. You see? We took that same acid, poured it in my hand here. My hand was starting to burn, right? But I cleared my throat. <sighs> yeah, here it comes, right? Took a little bit of what I cleared my throat with, the mucus, put that in the palm of my hand, and then poured the acid. Well, then I could play with the acid, and the acid wouldn't burn my hand. Why? Because my hand was protected by the mucus, right? So that's what's going on. So chloride clears the stomach of foodstuffs, yes? Okie dokie. Moving on. So there's our picture of the chloride there, and boom. We put it on to the electrolyte guy, right? And now, here's the second thing that chloride does. And this will be a slightly heavy concept, but you guys are, you guys are all ready for it. So anyway, uh, what does it do? Cleanse, <laughs> it should be an E on that. Cleanse the peritoneum. So cleansing the peritoneum, here's, what, here's how we'll explain that. Hmm. Oh wow. So in your peritoneum now, we're talking about inside your peritoneum, but not inside your colon, right? So if you think inside here, but not necessarily in your colon. Let's zoom in on that. Mm. Too hard to see that. But you got the uh, colon here and outside the colon, but still in this area. This is one of the cleanest areas of your body. Why? Because it's constantly being scrubbed by your chloride. So, let's see if you put it together. We give your client, right, a sodium chloride IV. Sodium what? in part, impacting what? Your client's mental status. Chloride, what? Between your stomach and your peritoneum, right? So this is constantly cleansing this area to the point that, have you ever heard of a VP shunt, right? VP shunt, you, 
maybe heard of it, you're like, ooh, I've heard of it, but I didn't know what it really meant. So VP shunt, what that's saying is ventriculo, ventriculo, referring to the ventricles in your brain, peritoneal shunt. So they, the doctors have run a tube from the patient's brain down into their peritoneum here in their gut. And you have to think to yourself, couldn't the CSF be compromised easily if you're connecting that tube to another part of the body? Then bacteria could go right up that tube and cause meningitis or encephalitis, right? But that's not the case, why? Because the chloride is constantly scrubbing this area, keeping it super, super clean. So your physicians, your surgeons, feel completely comfortable running that tube from your brain to your peritoneum, someplace safely clean, right? Good, good, okay. Now, so we've applied the crown of sodium and the cardiac for the heart and the chloride for the stomach and chloride again for the peritoneum. So chloride twice here. Now what we wanna do is take a look at magnesium. And in keeping with our letter pattern, right? Magnesium in what? Muscle relaxation. Magnesium relaxes muscles. And this is why uh, magnesium can tend to act like a kind of a natural blood pressure reducer, right? Because it relaxes muscles. It relaxes the muscles around your artery and drops your blood pressure. So be careful with that. Make sure you see your doctor before you initiate that kind of therapy, right? Good. Okay. Now, so this is a picture of a muscle with a little slice out of it there. So muscles, magnesium relaxes muscles. And we're gonna do is put those muscles on one side of electrolyte man, okay? So arm and leg, reminding us that what? Those muscles are being relaxed by magnesium. Now, what we wanna do is take a look at calcium. And remember that calcium calcifies bone. Right? But bone and teeth, actually. So, calcifying bone and teeth. Yes? Alright, so let's take a look at that. And we're going to put calcium on one end of the bone. The stronger, right? More calcified, whiter part of the bone. Calcium. Calcifies bone and teeth. Okay? Next, we have phosphorus. And what does phosphorus do? It promotes bone health. Right? So, Phosphorus works with your calcium and helps to strengthen your bone. And this was a concept that we reflected on back in diagnostic studies when I was discussing the musculoskeletal labs. Check that out. Okay? Be sure and stop by there and check that out. All right, now, so phosphorus, we said, promotes bone health. We're putting phosphorus on this other end of the same bone. Okay? And let's apply that to electrolyte men. And here's what we got, right? So we got our muscles on one side, bones on the other, but here, let's clear it up and take the pictures out. So what did we learn today about this electrolyte man that I, I was teaching you about, right? We said that he had a crown of sodium, right, good, okay? And he had a heart of potassium, excellent. What did we find in his stomach? Chloride that mixed with the hydrogen to form hydrochloric acid. Excellent. Under the stomach, into the peritoneum. What did we find there? Chloride as well, but this time, chloride was what? In the opposite location. Chloride up here was inside the GI tract. This chloride is what? Outside the GI tract, cleaning the peritoneum. That's why one is pictured as black and one is pictured as white. They're in different locations in this area, okay? Then we had magnesium. Helped us to remember that magnesium does what? Cause muscle relaxation, that letter M. And then in addition to that, we had calcium, which we know calcifies your bone, and phosphorus also promotes bone health, all right? And that is how we break down electrolyte man. And what's good about this is in an examination where you're being asked about how these electrolytes cause different responses in your body, if you're aware of this, 
it'll keep you focused and on target, okay? All right. Good job, everybody. Thanks again for subscribing and liking. Steady smart.